Sanbonani. Hello, how's it? Shalom. Good evening, Sanbonani, Sanbonani, Sanbonani. Welcome to it, Renant, everybody. You are watching the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Um, or rather, you're watching Liberty and Friends. My bad. It is a Sunday evening. That means Liberty Friends, 8 p.m. here on the Big Daddy Liberty Show. My name is Sikhle Ngobese, or Big Daddy Liberty. Uh, running a little bit behind schedule, uh, so I, I won't be as slick as I usually am. But uh, with that being said, welcome to it. Liberty and Friends, of course, is your weekly roundup show, the news roundup show, where we look at the news week that was. What got you interested, angry, talking um, over this past week? You know, we're going to look at the top headlines, and as always, on this format of the show, we have our guest, a panel of the friends, if I can call it that. Let me just turn the comments on there for a moment. Um, we are looking a little low on numbers, but uh, we're going to let people trickle in, please. Maybe what you can do in the meantime is share this link. Whatever platform you are watching on, please share this link. Get it out there. Tell your friends that we're on and that we're about to cook with grease as I like to say. Um, whilst you had it, also please smash that like button, whether you're watching on uh, uh, YouTube, Twitter, or on Facebook. Please hit that like button the moment you enter, hit that like button, and please remind everybody else in the comment section to hit that like button. Remember, this show is completely interactive, so I'm gonna let my guests come on in a moment, and your comments, will be filtered through on screen throughout the course of the evening. Guys, welcome to it. This is Liberty and Friends. And um, speaking about the Friends, I have a very interesting panel tonight. Some faces you've seen before. In fact, I think all faces. Ah, no, one face you haven't seen before. And uh, with that being said, let me bring them on camera now. It will take me a moment, guys. Please bear with me. Um, Let's see, who do I see first? Well, um, the, the newest face, perhaps, on the Big Daddy Liberty Show, a chap who uh, we've been mates for a while now. I've known him for quite a while. I'm talking, of course, about Werner Human, who, of course, is with the Trade Uni uh, Solidarität, or Solidarity in English. Let me just bring him on screen. Werner, welcome to Liberty and Friends. Thank you so much for the opportunity, C. Claire, and welcome to my guests as well. I look forward to the discussion. I've been having some connection problems in the last few seconds, actually, so I hope that I can be audible, but I look forward to the discussion so much. So thank you so much for having me on. Hi, Sikhle. I hope you can hear me. I couldn't hear you there, but I, I'm hoping that was my introduction. So if I'm speaking over anyone else now, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> um, good evening to you, of course. Thank you for having me on. Always a pleasure. And good evening to my fellow panelists. Uh, really looking forward to the discussion. Um, I hope you've had a good week so far, and hopefully we can set up the next week going forward on this discussion. I still can't hear you, Sikhle. Maybe the others can hear you, but I, I definitely can't, so.
All right, guys, I think uh, the sound should be on now. Ah, there we go. Thank you, Susan Ellis, who confirms that now we have sound. Thank you, Susan. Super appreciate. Oh, no. Uh, Brenkis Daniel says no sound. Jacques Vin says there is sound. Okay, guys, I'm not sure which is which at the moment. So I'm just going to wait for a consistent sound is back or you can hear me and we'll get the ball rolling. Okay, perfect. Jack Patrick, uh, Sim Raul uh, Tim Rowlands, uh, uh, Sam Monque. Okay, perfect, guys. The sound is back. Um, let's get straight back into the show. Uh, let me get back on screen. Werner Human, of course, who is from Solidarity, that's the trade union. Uh, let's hope that he's fixed his gremlins. Um, thank you, Moto Abatu. Thank you, for, brother, I, uh, for that confirmation. Uh, all right. Werner is still struggling. <laughs> Guys, I'm sorry about this. It is gremlins. It happens. Um, let me bring Chris back on screen. I hope he can hear me now. Chris, can you hear me now? I can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Welcome to it, my brother. Um, the next space who I see here, I want to get onto the stream as quickly as possible. He's all the way out in Peter Retief tonight, so he might have some connection issues. I'm, I'm hoping not, but uh, Gabriel Krauser, uh, good to have you back on the show. Oh, man, it's it's good to be back here with you, with you, Sinclair. I am out here in the in the sticks, so I, I hope that I come through loud and clear, but I can hear you loud and clear, which is very good. Awesome, my brother. Good to have you on. And of course, uh, last but definitely not least, the host of the Man Patria podcast. That is, of course, Udumo Denga. Dumo, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Sikhe. And I'm um, looking forward to having a great discussion today. Hey, Amen. We have a lit conversation tonight. Uh, do forgive me, Gavio, if you see me turning down every now and again. My laptop is right here with all my notes. But um, let's get straight into it, fellas. You know, it's been a rather interesting week. Uh, we'll give Verna an opportunity just to fix his gremlins, um, and then we'll have him uh, join us when he is ready. Um, but it's been a very interesting week, um, you know, in terms of the news headlines, as I realized that I didn't uh, prepare my customary glass of water. Uh, um, <laughs> guys, let me begin with the international headlines. Perhaps the one issue that dominated the news cycle for well on the majority of the week, Derek Chauvin, the chap who uh, was seen in those infamous videos and, and uh, photos as having knelt on uh, George Floyd for what was uh, nine minutes and some, some change, some seconds, um, was found guilty in the United States courts in Minneapolis uh, for three counts, effectively, two related to uh, second and third degree murder in that part of the world. That's their terminology. Um, and of course, one that we are quite also um, used to in this country, uh, what we call culpable homicide, but they call... Um, manslaughter. Manslaughter, manslaughter. Um, let me begin with you, Gabes. You had a look at this uh, verdict. You had a look at the trial and the, the, the furor around it, you know, with various vested interest groups taking their little camps, you know, and, and espousing their opinions. Your thoughts on the entire process and this outcome? Yeah, I mean, so as a journalist, I like to distinguish between the court and the court of public opinion. Uh -huh. And it's the nature of the court of public opinion to be a little bit faster and looser with the facts and with the truth for there to be more jumping to conclusions. But, I mean, this case, it was extreme. We had very extreme levels of confidence about what the verdict should be before the facts had come out on both sides, both those who thought that Chauvin should be acquitted and those who thought he should be put behind bars until he rots in pieces. My reading was always that uh, we, should, we should hold on for as long as we can to hear all the facts before we come to a conclusion. The alternative is, it's an old-fashioned term, prejudice, which is when you judge first and then seek facts later. Um, and, yeah, after the state made its case against Mr. Chauvin, I thought it was looking very good for the state and very tough for the defense. But I thought, let's keep our eyes open, let's keep our minds open and see what the defense has to bring. Its expert witness came up to argue that cause of death could not be connected to the knee and other pressures applied on George Floyd, that witness was torn to shreds. 
uh, very conservative, very sympathetic parties found the same thing uh, because it is the case. Um, the second issue was whether if he was the cause of death, which he was, uh, this might be mitigated or reasonable in some sense. And the arguments there, especially coming from uh, basically police experts uh, who have practice in the fields, who've been in the army, tough people, uh, hard people. I uh, still couldn't find that the use of force was justified. It was justified in the beginning. It was absolutely correct to put Floyd on the ground. He had tried to resist arrest. He's kicked his way through the car. He wouldn't get in the car. He was acting in an erratic fashion. It was absolutely correct to take him down. But to keep him down is a different story. And, yeah, my reading was that uh, that a guilty verdict uh, would be correct. That's the verdict that came through. I think it's important to bear in mind second and third degree murder as well as the manslaughter charge effectively. Uh, do not require that it was Chauvin's intent directly uh, and particularly to kill George Floyd, only that it was his intent to hurt Floyd and that that uh, uh, intent to harm uh, was reckless or depraved, risking death for the second degree murder count and for the other counts that he just acted in a way where death was foreseeable and he should have taken another route, but he didn't. So inside the court, to my mind, justice was served. I thought the procedure was professional. I thought sometimes the witnesses are a bit silly, but for the most part, it was very serious. The defense, the state, they both had their chance to speak. The judge kept things neutral. The jury kept uh, to the side. Very good. Outside in the court of public opinion, another story. And the most extreme version, of course, is Maxine Waters, who was asked as, as a member of their parliament, shall we say, what should happen if uh, if Chauvin is not convicted? And she said, well, we must keep confronting and we must, we must keep toy-toying, I think would be the South African translation. And uh, that's just not acceptable. The judge himself, and this is the most important point to conclude on, said that so reckless were those comments that they give grounds for mistrial. And so the defense might appeal that the jury couldn't possibly have been neutral, given the kind of political rhetoric coming out from politicians and the like. And so they might have to go through the whole process again. And on the second round, of course, you might get a different outcome. So extremely reckless behavior uh, from that one particular Democratic representative, but also from others that we can get to. Sitley, you're muted. I can't believe it. Oh my goodness, the my big man's on. voice. There, there we go. go. There uh, we go. I'm back. That's uh, um, uh, maybe just whilst I'm at it, let me bring on Uvagna. He is he has uh, expunged his uh, gremlins, and I think he is uh, oh, there. He is. Hey, Tara, Vagna, welcome to it. Uh, we're just talking about this Derek Chauvin trial. You know, I, I know you had uh, a, a particular view on it, and um, you know. Gabriel's just given us a, a, a nice overview in the sense of what he thought of the, the, the happenings, if you will, inside of court and outside of court, because that really were the, the two tales of this particular case. Chris, I'm going to come to you in a moment because there's a different point I want to put to you, uh, perhaps the libertarian case in all of this. And Demoal, I'll also uh, sort of put you on the spot with that one too. But Varna, talk to me about your assessment. Um, you know, from my perspective, I also think the... Uh, the, the the verdict was was a sound one. I mean, one could foreseeably, reasonably see that uh, Chauvin's actions were what led to uh, the the death of Floyd. Um, and it's a Floyd Chibumbo, my bad, and my, my apologies for that uh, near slip. But the the the, the death of George Floyd, uh, in the sense that you know, putting a knee on someone's neck, it, it, a reasonable human can foresee that this might cause serious harm, if not death. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think Gabriel set out a quite a good chronologically events of the of what had happened at court. But what is interesting is is although the verdict is correct, you would have I would say even a third force or a third front at play. Here. And what I'm referring to here is a sort of a cult personality around George Floyd, where in court mm. you have to make your assessment on based on fact and argument, and you have to present it and have to be convincing. And remember the the American judicial services uh, service uh, how they work is that you've got to have everyone there on the jury uh, to decide positive for a case. So the evidence must be overwhelming if you have a situation where all of them say you are guilty. But the other fact you've got a political narrative or narrative or a drive rather that ignores the facts and ignores yeah. those those things. And you've got a situation where George Floyd uh, around him said this cult personality. Um, confirming everything that that the Black Lives Matter movement has stated in the past, 
there was around social media a photo that circulated it was interesting to me at the place where george floyd was murdered there's a photo there to to actually caution white people vit visiting the the center to say you must be very sensitive uh, you must not uh, you must come here to mourn and you must yeah. witness and if you are actually someone who oversteps that boundaries and you see a white person uh, being too flancy walking around there um you must you must as a white person cause cause that white person to say i must change course or change my behavior don't let a black person be burdened with that so you got that sort of thing also and that's also in play there outside of the court uh, public court of public opinion and i think the popular debate in the united states should get down to what the, that happened at the trial let's look at the facts i think the ir published a a statement i think last year on the facts on police killings in, in the united states so they are conflating quite a few things here so although the verdict was absolutely correct and uh, derek chauvin has is a murderer we must not say because of that therefore the blm and all their assertions are therefore correct and i think that's where the debate also needs to to be taken to be taken further no, I would, I would agree with you, and there's this element which I, I want to raise on the show because the moment you touch it, you know, you, 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 you're, you're bombarded by, you know, the, the, the bleeding heart types who would rather see the soft and mushy in this, but not the facts. And the fact is this, guys, of course, uh, Derek Chauvin's actions led to the death of, ooh, 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 no, ooh, 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 of George Floyd. Um, I think the, the, the outcome was right in that, but George Floyd himself was not a saint. He, this, this guy was actually quite a scumbag in terms of the uh, previous uh, uh, encounters he had with the police, previous cases that he had caught on, and really even in that particular moment, high on drugs, uh, belligerent, resisting arrest. You know, one of the things that, that has struck, struck me, to more, let me come to you, Chris, I'll come to you in a moment, is the, the race grifters. The race grifters have latched onto this, and for them, it now proves every assertion they've been making that you know blacks uh, in America are you know uh, killed disproportionately higher uh, by the police because they argue because they argue police are going hunting for blacks uh, in order to kill them, and uh, Derek Chauvin is a good example of that. They'll tell us, and um, and the point that Uvarna is making that I want you to chew on is in that area where uh, Floyd. Uh, had lost his life, it's become the George Floyd Square. And there's almost a, a religiosity to it. They've, they've, be, they've become a cult-like religion where all must kneel at the altar of George Floyd. And the, if you're white, you must be self-deferential and, and you know, uh, uh, beat yourself uh, and, and prostrate yourself in front of black people. Dumo, what's going on here? Why is this even acceptable, acceptable lingo from the broadly the left, to be honest? Well, yeah, um, it's for many reasons. Um, I think primarily it's it's because of the fact they, they're trying to use a divide and conquer strategy. It's, it seems that when you have one group of people against the other and you try and you create a victim group, it seems that that victim group is perfect for the, the objectives that you want to achieve as a left-wing organization. So I think that's probably the reason why that is the case. And also it's, it's not helpful, um, you know, in the long run because – you know, based on what Verna is saying and based on what Gabriel has been saying as well, it just shows the nuance of the, the case, you know, and, and I'm glad it was highlighted. And also from the libertarian perspective as well, I mean, we may be a bit hard on the police because um, there are instances where police do use uh, force. I mean, you know, in America, they have this no-knock warrants and so forth that seem to give the policemen an advantage in the courts of law. So I think, um, you know, that's also another element to add to the case. And then there's the, the race hustlers who make irresponsible statements um, to gain mileage on the issue, which I think for me is not appropriate. I mean, I saw on Facebook the other day, I'm not going to mention names. Uh, someone actually put out a post where the, the police department, when George Floyd passed away, the, the, the statement read that George Floyd died because of medical complications. And the person who shared this said that this is a sign of racism and we need to document racism. Like now, if you are going to say that that is racism, that is a long stretch. Really, at best, you can say that they were wrong or they were lying. But to say it's racism is very irresponsible. And they're doing it because why? Race hustling seems to make them rich at the end of the day. Mm. And, 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 you know, oh, this is something that actually really uh, annoys me. And this is why I wanted to come to you with this one, Chris. Because I know we, we, we'll, we'll 
you, you'll set it out quite nicely. There is a case to be made. There is a case to be made that the interaction between police and all citizens in America, period, regardless of race, are added to and the likelihood of you encountering a cop are greater because of the sheer asinine at times laws and numerous laws that politicians pass. Often at times petty shit, excuse my language, because it really annoys me. I mean, there's a video I, I shared on social media of kids, teens, uh, black teens in America who are just riding their bikes. And there has, happens to be some arbitrary bylaw there that says, no, no, you can't ride your bike here without a license. Um, you know, that, that, that age old uh, tool of the state of licensing to control all aspects of life. Thus placing you in confrontation inevitably with the police, which is an agent of the state, which uses force, that doles out force in order to uphold the rule of law. But at times the laws themselves can be completely asinine. Talk to me about that one element. And the other element I wanted to talk about is this notion of the, the, the special privileges that agents of the state, i.e. also the police give themselves by way of what, what's called qualified immunity in America. I suppose your second point is more of a rule of law point, that idea that people are supposed to be equal in, front, in the eyes of the law, but then depending on your position within the state and the structures of the state and the powers that you enjoy, for example, if you're a police officer, you have certain protections and certain um, privileges, as it were. So I think that in and of itself is a problem. If we actually think that a society should have a, a robust implementation of the rule of law, where everyone is equal, to the first part of what you were raising, I think from the classically liberal, libertarian point of view, and I'm going to paraphrase here, but Ayn Rand, she said, if you want to get rid of, of honorable people, uh, sort of respectful people, make laws that, that outlaw respectable behavior. Make it impossible for people to actually follow the law because the laws are so asinine, irrational. They make even the smallest acts. For example, in South Africa, in Johannesburg, we often see police, and the FMF has done work on this, we see police getting rid of street hawkers who are trying to make a living. I mean, that's, that's trying to like feed your family and care for your family. During lockdown, we've seen this. For people who could work from home, they have Wi-Fi, they could work in the suburbs, that kind of thing. For people who had to, do, had to travel to work, they couldn't do that. That was outlawed because they couldn't use public transport because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. When you make it impossible for people to make a living, sort of quote-unquote honorably, they're going to resort to other means to, to do what, what they have to do. We saw the growth of the, of the illicit uh, alcohol and tobacco industry because the states push those things in that direction. So I think you're very right. There's lots of examples we can talk about. We can talk about marijuana use, for example. That I mean, that should be legalized. One could argue from a hard libertarian point of view, any drug use that doesn't result in violent behavior towards other people should be legalized. If you don't use force towards other people, why shouldn't you be allowed to use drugs in the privacy of your own home kind of thing? So we'll see this more and more. Uh, the more laws that a, that a society implements and that a state implements, the more we'll see the sort of behavior. And cops themselves are put in a difficult position. I mean, they have to follow the job, as it were. It's also a living for them. They're expected to follow these irrational edicts from whatever bureaucrat comes up with. I mean, someone, our minister against trade and industry, Ibrahim Patel, banned e-commerce. Well, a, a policeman might be called to go to that business where that is operating e-commerce and shut it down. He might disagree with it, but he has to make a living. So in the end, I think it makes victims unnecessarily of everyone involved. And if we don't arrest the, you know, to use the word, if we don't stop the continual growth of the state in every facet of our lives, we'll just see more of this violence escalate. Absolutely. And again, I must say this, you know, and it might be unpopular, but really, I don't care. Um, I would argue, and I would really put it to people, that, that Floyd was actually really a, a victim of that, um, a victim of an excessive amount of legislation by the very same politicians who stood on his grave and then said, oh, you know, we loved uh, Blacks and Floyd and blah, blah, blah. You know, we, we stand for Blacks, they'll tell us. But really, this is the same politicians who are passing numerous laws that place often poor people, and inevitably in America, disproportionately black individuals in greater conflict with the law, in greater conflict with police, often at times for petty laws. Now, this is not sorry, just, Claire, just so, sorry, just to mention on that point, sorry, I should have mentioned yeah. this earlier, but just with Floyd sure. and Gabriel can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I think he, I mean, he was trying to sell loose cigarettes or something to a store clerk and then the store clerk, but Gabriel can, can correct me, but I, that was the sort of line that I heard initially. 
uh, and then he had a, a fake twenty dollar note. Um, again, that, again, don't get me wrong. That was a a a break in the line. Gabriel, let me let you come in there. Um, maybe just to clarify things if we both have it wrong. Yeah, no, the 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 the, the cigarette illegal cigarette sales was a case in New York a couple of years before that. I for, I forget the guy's name. Um, oh yeah, that was uh, Holder, wasn't it? Uh, was it Holder? Eric Holder. Eric yeah. Holder, correct. Uh, if, if I can, since I've got the floor for a moment, just jump in sure. on um, two points raised, I see in the chat by our wonderful listeners. One of them was that uh, Chauvin was on trial, Floyd wasn't on trial, so it doesn't matter that Floyd was a drug addict and a criminal and so on. And sorry, Gabriel, just one, one second. Eric Garner, sorry, Eric Garner, I just had to get Eric it out. Garner. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I just want to say about that, look, that's completely correct from the court of law point of view. And, and that's one of the things that I respect so much about this trial. It what The jury did not hold it against uh, Floyd that he was not an upstanding citizen. Or rather, it didn't say because Floyd was, an, uh, was not an upstanding citizen, therefore Chauvin could act however he pleased. Yeah. The police have to treat all citizens with a sense of, with a duty of care. Uh, that's an important thing to remember. The reason that it's worth bringing up what kind of character Floyd had the fact that he had uh, performed armed robberies, that he had invaded a pregnant woman's home and held a gun to her, that he had multiply relapsed and gone back into drugs and so on. The reason that matters is because of what politicians in America are trying to do with George Floyd. They're trying to make him out to be a hero. And one of the facts, look, I think you guys are exactly right about petty laws uh, promoting essentially a conflict between the citizenry and the police. But there's another side to this, which is about race. And it's the fact that in America, to my mind, bl black men are encouraged to be criminals. They are valorized as criminals. And in part, this is like an old school point about rap songs and whatever, but I think people can take that with a sense of irony uh, because that's art. And I listen to Tupac and Biggie Smalls and Eminem and all kinds of crazy shit, I beg my language. And I see that it's art and I apply an ironic distance. But when a politician says, as Nancy Pelosi said, the senior ranking member in America's parliament, as we can call it, when she says George Floyd sacrificed his life for justice, they're going off the handle. They, 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 they're sending a signal, a very earnest signal to young black men that if you do this kind of thing and you get killed by the cops, then, then you're a hero. And during the Black Lives Matter protests, yeah, the institute we you know we wrote about the fact that uh, the best uh, uh, science criminologist in America, uh, the leader being Roland Fryer, who is himself a black man, the Harvard's youngest uh, MacArthur genius grant recipient, showed that black people are not disproportionately killed by the cops, unarmed or otherwise. Yeah. But what distressed me is that he had to make the point that, unfortunately, even controlling for income and education and all those kinds of things, there is more criminality within uh, the black demographic than the white demographic in America. And it's a very interesting question why that is. And to my mind, a big part of the answer was given on during one of the Black Lives Matter protests when a black man killed a cop and then someone managed to interview that man's mother and she said, but, but he killed a cop. That's a good thing. Now, if because the cops hate black people, if your own mother is proud of you for committing murder, what chance did you stand in life? Everyone oh. comes from a home. And if you're oh. getting those signals that being a criminal is sticking it to the man and is, is the same thing as Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela or Abraham Lincoln or whatever, then you are, you, you, you're being led down a path to evil. It's, and the path to evil is laid with good intentions. But it's this, it's this good intention idea that, you know, if, if you're a black guy, you're so victimized that you must break the law mm. uh, to prove your own virtue. That I think is, is, a, is, a, is an important point to hold on to and to remember in the context of this good verdict. Here we have the criminal justice system correcting for a bad mistake in any society. They're going to be murders and rapists and cops that go wrong. Has the system got the capacity to correct for it? Yes, it has. And no one stands up and says, it has happened and that's good. And instead they say basically that if you're black and you're American, you should be breaking the law because the law is fundamentally corrupt. And to me, that is a, I read that as, a, as, as, as cruel and unusual punishment that is disproportionately falling on black people, but it of course falls across all Americans.
And guys, I'm sorry that we're spending such a long time on this, but it, it really was an interesting case. Uh, insofar as the, the, what was not said about it for me, I think was the more interesting part. The last thing I want to bring in here, and this is where people often accuse me of being a conservative, is the role of the failure of families. Families, especially in the black community, because we see it in the disproportionate uh, uh, number and the higher number, I can not say disproportionate, but rather the higher number of young black males often being in conflict with the law. And there is an argument that is often made, and I one which I ascribe to, that you can also pin this down on the lack of positive male role models in the Black community because of their absence in the family in America. And really, that same argument can translate to here in South Africa. There, there are people on the Cape Flats right now who can tell you, yes, I, I identify with that exact point because we see it, for example, amongst our own young uh, men here who the first real strong male figure they see are the gangsters who are out there living the flashy life, you know, looking as though they're, they're strong because they project violence, you know, the ability to, to, to exercise their will using violence. And they suck in these young men who are looking for role models. I'm going to come to you because this is an argument that I think you know, you and I maybe off the record, you know, in, in our little meetings, I won't say more than that, have had a chat about this particular issue. Um, Donna, maybe weigh in here. Let's see, Lickley, you just point again to the exact uh, theme that that the, in relation to family. Am I right? Yeah, you know, the the idea that a lot of what plays into what we're seeing with young black men in particular coming into conflict with the law is if you look at some of the stats around family units in, the, in those particular cases, let me bring it home, let me bring it home. Mm. 2018, the last stats I saw, 62% of all new births in this country had no information on the family unit. Research released last year by the South African uh, Human Rights, um, I can't think of the C, uh, human, uh, excuse me, South African Human uh, sciences, something or other, um, indicated that as many as 72% of households were single parent households in this country. This has significant out, um, impact on the kind of young men you are pushing out into society, especially if they don't have a positive male role model to have in the household. Yeah, I was involved in a case, a uh, quite interesting case, which re involved religious freedom in schools. But part of the preparation of our case, we looked at the, uh, the, the immediate statistics we could find, and we also employed a professor and a doctor that did studies on the conditions of the home of the learners of those schools. Now, what was at play here was religion freedom at, religious freedom in schools, and we also looked at the, the situation that what the schools are teaching the children and the role that the schools play in the lives of the children. What we found in that particular schools, which were six schools, that most of them, uh, about half of them, have parents either divorced or it's a single parent raising them or some sort of broken, broken family situation. And, and we did a survey amongst the children via a, it was a scientific survey and we had a, a, a psychologist there interviewing the children and they found that the school plays such an important part in continuing and uh, converting to them uh, values that they can take further, that the absence of the school means an absence of, of a value system. So the, this discussion is not about the role of schools, of course, but it just highlighted to me how deep in society it is that there's actually no real uh, values that you would find. And many of the many of our youth in this country come from a broken home background, which means that the choices that they take are poorly informed. And uh, um, that, that just takes blew our mind away. And um, we end up winning the case, so, sort of, but um, for the learners there, when, when the psychologist um, questioned them in question appropriate uh, format, they, they found that if you take away the value-based system in schools, that it would be a tragic and traumatic event for them. And that was mm -hmm. represented in, in court as well. So this is a very important issue to underline, the issue of, of values. And that what Gabriel has referred to, also in the American scene, you don't find that in the discussion. And I think the reason why you don't find that in the discussion is because it's politically incorrect. It's not co politically correct to say there's a role of the family. It's not politically correct to say that the black community doesn't have the same family structure or a sound family structure. 
And if that is a fact, I think the, the responsible politicians should go and say, this is, let's see how we can take this further. But political opportunism is unfortunately the way that the American politics is going at the moment. Absolutely. Guys, <clears throat> I must ask you at this onset to please indulge me with another 30 minutes because uh, <laughs> we did spend a long time on this. And um, to you, if you're watching, welcome. Join. You're joining us here on Liberty and Friends. We're beginning to cook with grease, as I like to say, as my guests ch chop into some of these issues. Uh, we just finished looking at the Derek Chauvin case and some of the associated social issues around that, which didn't make a uh, part of the the headlines and uh, the commentariat in this week. Guys, I'm gonna bring us back home um, to what is arguably, uh, you know, there's a famous line in the movie Snatch, which is never, never underestimate the predictability of stupidity. And in this particular instance, I'm talking about a one uh, black, black, black first, land first, or BLF in short, who the big headline we saw this week was in one of the big papers here, BLF, it says, vows to overturn apartheid-styled leases as it occupies a lodge in KZN. There's a nice big caption, a picture there, of uh, its leader, Andy Lem um, in conversation, usually probably talking crap as usual, um, having taken over a lodge in Sodwana Bay in KZN as a precursor to their program. So this is probably something we'll see more of, um, of overturning uh, these so-called uh, apartheid leases. BLF members occupied the coastal lodge in a conflict that has since landed before the courts. The party said that the 12 month lease uh, from the local Mbila traditional authority to run the lodge um, or disputed, excuse me, the lease uh, uh, to, uh, to run this lodge, um, as it argued the tribal authority owns the land on which the lodge is built. Um, and their leader, of course, is alleging that the owner of this facility, this lodge, failed to produce uh, lease documents um, that, which would show that they are allowed on the land. It's on the basis of this, therefore, that they literally moved in, <clears throat> muscled in, rather, on the lodge and have now taken it over. Guys, the threat to property rights, we've seen it from the left broadly in this country. This is no different. Um, uh, Chris, let me come to you then, Gabriel. Well, most, uh, it's, it's gratifying to hear that they're against apartheid vestiges and structures because then they'll be fully in support of title deeds. So they should come and help the FMF with rolling out title deeds around the country. So <laughs> hallelujah, and I agree with them there. I mean, it's a simple case of, it, it, with anyone, if it's a restaurant, business, home, hotel, whatever, if someone come, comes onto someone else's private property, then the police need to get involved. I mean... As a liberal, I think the state should have a role in some things, and part of that is protecting people's private property. So, I mean, of course, now this is a highly charged situation. The whole discussion around expropriation is very charged. I think it diverts from real issues. If land reform was such a big priority for the government, as they say it is, they would have been spending billions on land reform and not billions on bailing out South African Airways and ESCOM and that kind of thing. So it's all lip service, of course. But, yeah, I think in a nutshell, the police should have gotten involved a while ago. How it gets resolved now is going to be very difficult. I think let's see what the court finally comes up with. But again, we go back to the role of the state, how it should be defined. If property rights are not clearly defined, you're going to see more and more conflict between different groups. And of course, for them, it's a constituency thing. It's a marketing thing. I think, for example, COVID-19 was very bad for the FFs. So they're going to start doing more things now to get into the news again. Blackland First will do the same thing. They're going to do more uh, stunts like this to get into the news and garner up support. Maybe mm. to you, Gabriel. Gabriel, maybe let me add something, because there's a nice question here as to why the police haven't arrested them. And this is where it got a little confusing for me, and I wanted to see what you can make of this. The, the, the this is now the, the, the response from the manager of the facility, a one um, Herman Komrink, uh, who says, open quote, the staff is still here. BLF members are running the place. Uh, it is immaterial to me as to who the owner is. That didn't make sense to me. But anyway, he continues to say, what concerns me is the intimidation, swearing, and rudeness from BLF when they when they arrived. Uh, most guests will have packed and left the facility. I don't quite get that, that, that um, uh, argument around as to who owns the place. And there seems to be a, a concession that, you know, the BLF is here to stay. 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I think we must take, we must enjoy one fact, uh, which is that uh, land invaders are, are no longer pretending to all be poor. Of, this was most saliently brought to our attention at the start of the year when a group of, I think, former UCT students uh, in a, a sisterhood of the Traveling Pants Club invaded a sort of Clifton uh, plush home for the, for the purpose of defeating apartheid. And, you know, one of, uh, one of the fundamental uh, disconnects in this country is, is, is the interests of ordinary South Africans and the interests of the political elite. But as long as mm. the political elite can get away with pretending that they serve the interests of the poor, mm -hmm. then, then people who don't have the time to scrutinize the detail of every story uh, can be taken for a ride. But the more you see this kind of a thing, the more the lies exposed that this is not really about uplifting the poor. This is about uplifting the rich. And so you have uh, well-to-do politicians taking ownership of a well-to-do lodge. You have a relatively well-to-do lodge manager who says, you know, I'm a little bit worried about people being rude, but I don't really care who owns this as long as I'm still getting a salary and can pay for my car and whatever. And, and, and what's the bottom line? Well, the customers are gone. Well, guess who's going to be the first to be fired when you run out of money or the first not to get paid? It's going to be the busboy, uh, to use a waitering term that I was a busboy once. It's the, that's the one who scrubs the dishes and pulls them in. Um, so, you know, I, when I say we should be grateful, it's, it's not to say that this isn't uh, another devastating assault on property rights. It is just to say that it's so conspicuously disconnected with any kind of program uh, that helps the poor, that uh, at, at least at least the mask is slipping. Mm. And Varun, I'm going to come to you. Sorry, Dumo, to, to leave you last year. But the same owner or manager then goes on to say, well, you know, to the, to the claim made by Katama that they, there's no lease to speak of, he then retorts and says, well, actually, there is a lease. Otherwise, quote, the court wouldn't have granted us the interdict. So there clearly is an interdict at play here. But one then has to maybe ask the question, where are the police in all of this, in terms of doing what Chris argued earlier on is a role of the state to protect our property rights? Uh, Sikhle, we can go on and what's supposed to happen and what's mm. before court. And, and even the owner, he tried, when the BLF came, he tried to appease them a bit. And he gave them uh, food and drinks and even alcohol. It's, it's on record on that. But I would argue something else, which is a constructive point to the BLF. And I'm saying that sarcastically, of course. Um, they understand of all the proponents, of all the proponents of expropriation without compensation, the BLF understands that best of all the proponents. They understand that if you employ or further advance a policy like expropriation without compensation, you are criminalizing private ownership, especially in the context of the country, criminalizing ownership, or white ownership of property. And when that, that expropriation without compensation provides a sort of a moral high ground for them. So if the moral argument is that if you are, let's say the Sudwana Bay uh, case study, um, you are uh, occupying land illegally, you are a criminal, and then it's completely rational for the BLF to storm that lodge and say, you know, if if this if if you are if you are actually a criminal in your in, in the essence of it, then why can't I come over and just take over the lodge? It's interestingly, Mukama is also quoted as saying that this is not about the law. This is about justice. This is not about the law. So they understand the implications of expropriation without compensation, and they are doing it very consistently with, with that message. And I believe they are with what expropriation without compensation actually represents. They understand it very well, and they are actually consistent in how they take it further. And uh, um, so they are going to continue to do that. You will find the courts, you have, even if you have police, police that is acting there and the police that is active and, and executing court orders, that won't go away because they've been giving the moral content of their conviction to take away Absolutely. private ownership. And um, so they are very consistent in their view. That's, that's my read of it. And um, I'm not sure how it will pan out. I think it would be more confrontation going forward. Uh, uh, but um, they understand the message and they're going to continue to do that. Absolutely. If you're just joining us, we are at the halfway mark, the new official halfway mark of tonight's show. We're discussing the Black Land, Black First, Land First Party, BLF in short, led by Andy Lemkutama, who have decided to occupy 
um, as these lefties often call it, occupy uh, to the rest of us <laughs> squats on um, uh, someone's uh, uh, business, in this case, a lodge in Sordwana Bay. Uh, Dumo, let me come to you because, again, there's some nice points that were made here, which is usually the, the emotional arguments that will be sold by the political elites, often to poorer residents, that these policies, often policies that are on the left of confiscating stuff from the rich or whites, as you would have in this country since it has a racial tinge, um, confiscating things from the rich is, oh, we're doing it on your behalf, uh, dear black person, you know, so, so that even if I, the, the, the rich black politician become richer and richer off of the state grift, you, the poor black, are living through me. That, that, that's the argument we're hearing now, are we not? The, the vicarious black politician rich, as they are, who black people are living through them. And that sticks it to whitey, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it appears so. And um, I mean, with Andy Lim Litam and, um, and his rhetoric, I mean, I, I, would, I would just like to know, where was he when David Rajase was having problems uh, acquiring land, you yeah. know? You know, where was he when in the Eastern Cape where um, a family was kicked off or not even family, but farmers were were, were getting evicted or off their property um, right. by the state? They, they're not there. They were not there because obviously this is about political opportunism. I mean, they ran in the 2019 election. They, they just missed out on the seats. So they need to try and get relevance uh, back in again. And uh, it's it's really unfortunate. And this thing of living vicariously on black people's behalf is, is, is silly. Um, you know, it kind of gives off the impression that black people should not own property; that someone else should own it for them. Mm. And then now, uh, if you hear it if, now, if you see it like that, then it's like, well, who's the racist in the room here? Who mm -hmm. needs um, you know, <laughs> who needs the white racist? And we just got one already. You know, we got one leading us. So it's like it, it, it's so it's so ironic, you know, and. I just think for me, you know, people just need to like kind of wake up. Mm. They don't have to understand the ideology, but at least they have to understand that, listen, this is all a show. This is all just to show that they are moral. But at the end of the day, when they have the power, they will take land away from blacks and whites right. and anyone else. So right. we just need to get that clear. And hopefully people can see that much sooner rather than later. Absolutely. Um, guys, I'm going to move us on. Um, just to keep things ticking a little bit, we're still here at home. Uh, an issue perhaps which is, uh, if I stick to just the notion of contention and, and conflict, I had this conversation with Gabriel uh, on Wednesday on the Big Daddy Liberty Show. Guys, if you want to watch that, just go to uh, the BDL page on YouTube or on Facebook. It's even on Twitter. We had this conversation with U -U Gabriel who in his work as a Daily Friend journalist was on the ground in Pete Retief covering the events in that part of the world. Gabriel, I'm gonna ask you to be short in just letting us know what this case is all about. You're there at the moment in Pete Retief. Why are you there? What do you expect tomorrow? And I'll be joining you there tomorrow, by the way. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to seeing you, Sitle. So the gist of it is that uh, two brothers, Mkini Amos and uh, Zenzele Koka, died uh, two weeks ago now on Friday near a farm called Pampun Kral, here close to Petritif. And there's two versions of how that happened. One version says that seven poor black people went looking for work and then one of them was uh, taken hostage and then more uh, people arrived and then two of them were shot dead in cold blood. That's the version. And so we have five people in jail uh, for the last uh, uh, 14 days uh, based on that charge. The other version says... These guys, some guys showed up and they were harassing farm workers. Then Mr. Pothitter came along who works on that, who owns that farm. And uh, he was struck with a knopkiri. So they took Mr. Tlachwayo and they tied him up and they called the police. The police didn't come. Uh, but they, they detained him until the police would come, even though they're only five minutes away. Uh, they didn't come. And then more people came from both sides. And then there was an argument about releasing Mr. Tlachwayo. And then one Kolka brother took a steel pipe and struck Hans Mulman a blow to the head. Mulman is still in hospital uh, two weeks later. And uh, when he fell down, and con he, his gun was dislodged. The Kolka brother took that gun and then shot wildly, even shooting his own brother accidentally to death which is a, a double tragedy because on the reports I've heard that brother was still actually loyal to the farm, was still working there, whereas the shooter uh, had long since uh, 
uh, radicalized. And then uh, as he continued shooting, was himself shot dead in self-defense. So you've got these two versions. You've got a lot of people who only believe one version. Some people only believe another. And uh, you've got pol politicians. You've got the mayor of uh, Pichutif. You've got the premier of Mpumalanga. You've got the uh, criminal justice uh, leadership all saying, no, there's no doubt these guys are guilty and they're guilty of murders in August last year, even though no charges have been brought and they're guilty of all other kinds of things. And so they're terrible people. And if you release them, we're going to have a little civil war. In fact, the argument for against releasing them on bail coming from the investigating officer and coming from the state's prosecutor was that you can't release them. One reason is if you do so, there will be an anti-white race war. And I was privy to some of the reasons, I suppose, that that argument is not entirely untrue. Uh, which is to say I was sent by the police to go and find another police four blocks down from the court. And I didn't find any police. Instead, I found a mob who threw uh, a brick through my, the window of my car and shouted, uh, Whitey, we're going to kill you. And uh, five others I've confirmed have been uh, attacked as well. Uh, one of them uh, yeah, certainly feared for her life at least. Uh, and I've also had two reports, uh, independent uh, sources saying that there was another person later on who was attacked in the same fashion in his car and actually they threw enough bricks to smash the windows and then threw another brick and struck his head and he has been in hospital ever since as well as another man who was stabbed in the same place where I was attacked uh, who is still in hospital as well in a critical condition so things are quite hot here uh, tomorrow we uh, have been told there will also be another group called the Bitter Anders who are coming in support of the accused. So uh, you've got uh, a very volatile, potentially volatile situation. We hope that the police is going to keep law and order. And part of the reason that we're there is because this has taken national prominence and a little bit, you know, these, these kinds of cases, people want one case to stand for everything. Uh, it's a nice... It's a nice shortcut to the hard work of finding out the particular facts of a case. If you can just uh, see the generalities, then you don't have to figure out facts. And my favorite example of that, which any listener is welcome to go look up, is the first article on Petra Tief in the Daily Maverick, which said, I am a black man who experienced racism in Petra Tief in the 80s, and therefore I know that it was racist who killed these two black people in 2021. <laughs> And if you think I'm exaggerating, I please encourage you to go and find this piece and read it with your own eyeballs. Uh, to see how little investigative journalism you have to do to count as a truth teller in this country. <laughs> anyway, we're trying to do the opposite and really see what's going on. Uh, and, and we look forward to seeing you there, Sitle, uh, where you'll be uh, talking to people and see what they believe. I'll tell you exactly what I want uh, to, to, to do when I'm there. And that's to tell the story of perhaps the, the ordinary resident of Peter Retief the ordinary resident, black or white, who's looking at this as a resident of the town, seeing outsiders come in in order to do this, because that is what we were basically hearing from people on the ground, that it has become a spectacle of people who are often bust in by politicians in order to take over the town and create the impression of a race war. We saw the same thing in Senegal, where a town of ordinarily, let's, I'm gonna use a fictitious number here, of let's say 300 people suddenly had a thousand people on the day and you know, a, a commensurate number of police officers in order to police this. Again, those numbers are fictitious, I'm just making a broader point here, is that you suddenly see a town being descended upon by various interest groups. There's a very interesting comment that came up here, and Varad, I'm gonna come to you in a moment. Um, when, when mention of the bitter enders was made, um, I'm going to bring that comment back on because this is the, the same thing I heard from my source who I spoke to on this particular issue to say that actually these, these characters who represent one fringe side to what is the, the, the ANC and the uh, EFF other fringe side were actually told, guys, we don't need you here. We don't need you here. Yes, this town might have its own issues and those should be, you know, should be uh, dealt with by the residents of their own town, but you can almost see what it is when these, you know, uh, firebrand types try and insert themselves in what is already a powder keg like uh, Pete Retief. Let me bring you in, um, um, Varni. Your thoughts on this entire uh, debacle? Sikhle, uh, my my helicopter view on on all of this. It also rings to to what happened in Kulini quite a few years back, and I think right. what what Gabriel has done. 
He's also, and I think what you will do from tomorrow on is what Rian Milan did when Kalini came. He's just, he was all of this noise on all of the sides and they went there and see what were the facts. And that's the first order of business is just to establish what were the facts. And none of us here, and I, uh, I would think also the listeners and the watchers this evening, they will also not be, uh, they will also be guided by the facts and where the case leads. But my helicopter view on this is that for the country, this is actually, this is a burning point and it has the potential to, to erupt uh, uh, um, to do massive proportions. I've made the comment earlier to our WhatsApp group referring to the Cuban Missile Crisis in quotations. And what I mean by that is that you've got all of these sensitive, sensitive matters and a wrong move at the wrong time at a very sensitive matter could erupt in something which is, which is, which is bad for us all. It's bad for the country. It will get international press. It would give a bad view on the country. It will create instability everywhere. And the question must be, how do you defend yourself? Or how do you go about it when you are at those towns where we are, where we are, where we are affected? And I think it calls for stable leadership, trying to be a center in the in, in the position. But mm -hmm. I think we 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 have a crisis yet that that it may be potentially flare up again. And and we've seen it with Seneca, we've seen it with Colini, and those are those aren't silos. You would have every one of them is a build up to the next. So we don't have a situation where everything is settled. So we'll be watching very closely, but uh, my view is uh, it's, it's extremely, extremely concerning. And, and any one of the groups coming in might say a wrong thing, do a wrong thing, and, and um, all of us will lose at the end of it. Absolutely. And Dumo, I'm going to come to you because there's a point Gabriel made in the previous uh, topic era of Derek Chauvin, which is this notion of what happens in a court of law, evidence, facts, data, and the like, in order to discern, come to a decision versus what happens in the court of public opinion, where often it's the loudest voices who get to set the, uh, the mood, if you will. In this case, the loud EFF voices, the loud ANC voices, the loud bitter anger type voices. Whereas for me, here's my bottom line. I don't really know what happened on that day. As Gabriel said, there's, there's contested versions of the truth there that has to be um, found out and tested in courts to see what the facts are. But what I do know is two things. Number one, those five accused men, the, the four white farmers and the white, excuse me, uh, white farmers and the one black farm manager. And I only raised their race for the purposes of this discussion. I really couldn't care less otherwise. But their race is on trial here in the public court of opinion. Those men deserve a fair trial in the same way I would argue that a one Jacob Zuma, loathed as I am uh, to him and his character, also deserves a fair trial before a system that we all agree as South Africans should be impartial and equal to everybody. That's the first point. Um, the second point being the politicians, we need to hold them to a higher standard, especially when they come to neighborhoods like that and actually terrorize local residents, regardless of race. Because the one point to Gabriel made on Wednesday, which was absolutely critical, and I encourage you to read the, the news piece he wrote in the Daily Friend, www.dailyfriend.co.za. The one point he showed us was actually, it was both the white and the black residents looking on who were saying, this is absolutely terrifying. This frightens us. We don't know what's going on here. Those two points and just your, your, your quick view. Yeah, um, this is uh, a very sad story. It's a, it's a tragic situation from what I hear. And, you know, this is, where, but when a politician sees this, their eyes light up and they're like, okay, you know, I want to be president one day. I want to be in parliament one day. So let me see how I can exploit the situation to my advantage. And I think what's going to happen is that in the court of law, I do have confidence in our justice system. I do think they will get a fair trial. And obviously, if there are missteps along the way, there's also the appeal process. If you look at the mm. Kalini case, the, the, the decision was overturned through an appeal. So it's so I, I trust the, the justice system in that regard. However, what I'm concerned about is that when the, the, the politicians have kind of framed this in a way that if the decision does not go our way, we protest and we say there's an injustice. And then if it goes our way, then we kind of celebrate and virtue signal and everything like that. And I think... That's what they're going to do. They're going to try to set it up that way so that they really get people angry and, um, and energized and so forth. And then once the decision is made, they know we take this direction or the, another direction. So they've already planned it out, unfortunately. And I just hope that during the case, 
the emphasis of look let's get the facts let's see what happens that needs to be emphasized quite a bit and i hope the media does that because sometimes the media does not do that because hey they need to sell clicks they need to get the advertising revenue and so forth so that's also a tough one and and, and chris i must come to you i'm sorry man for for leaving you last and uh, i'm coming to you at the nine uh the hour mark in the show if you're just joining us and you're wondering why is the show still going on we have another half hour with our guests here chris hatting from the free market foundation Upra gabriel krauser from the daily friend he's a journalist in that part of the world uh, Varna Human, who's from Salazar Date, and of course, Dumo Denga, who is the host of the Man Patriot Show. Uh, Chris, I must come to you maybe as a final point, and I'm going to throw in a, a little sidebar for you here, because the, the, the chap who I was chatting to, uh, who lives in uh, Peter Retief, said to me, listen, my brother, I, I'm from Cape Town. I can tell you now, I'm one of those Cape liberals. Uh, I moved to Peter Retief, and I must say that, yes, we want these men to have a fair trial and the like, and I, we, you know, there's no disagreement there. But one of the things he did mention is that, you know, even in his in his view, there is and there are lingering cases of tensions in that community, uh, especially from the farming community. You know, there there is still racism, as he put it, and his fear is that the ordinary members of the community are not going to be able to build their own bridges, build their own relationships because of the politicians who come in and then become the loudest rah rah in that room. Talk to me about the importance of those voluntary um, relationships, voluntary cooperation, if I can put it that way, um, in communities. Why are they more important than relying on the state or politicians to dictate how people should relate to each other? Well, I think it goes to presuming that a bureaucrat in Bloemfontein or in Pretoria or Cape Town knows best how local communities should organize certain things and how they should interact with each other and engage. For them, they might have certain priorities that are much higher than for someone in, in a different part of the country. That isn't to say that the rule of law, those common ingredients shouldn't apply across the country, but how people apply them is up to them. It might even differ in certain suburbs in Johannesburg, to use an example. So even places that close to each other, it, it's not the same from every street to the next. So one shouldn't just presume, I guess, these 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 black and white easy uh, easy ways of classifying people. And that's part of, I think, the growth of politics into our daily lives. Everything is becoming high stakes. It's a matter of your quote unquote tribe. And in this case, I'm talking about politics. So which party you happen to vote for, if your flag is blue or it's yellow, green and black, or it's red. It matters most if your group gets into power because th there's so much politics, the state decides who wins and who loses. So in these communities, for example, the only way to that, that they might be told by politicians for them to get ahead is by taking from other people or by fighting or by being at each other's throats all the time. There's no view of growth, of prosperity, of working together, of mutual benefit, mutual voluntary interaction. It's very much a case of the only way to get ahead is by taking from someone else. So. And we, we see this, it's, it, it's interesting, I think one should always look at the intellectuals of a society to sort of determine where it's going. So if they, for example, in academia are talking about the way, you know, for example, free markets, capitalism, that kind of thing is evil, you can't create wealth, it's only redistribution, that's going to filter down eventually to the commentary at the media and then into people, how people live and interact. And they're going to say, okay, well, that person has a farm or he has a house or whatever you want to take. And he got that through taking it from my family or my ancestors or something like that. So I think it all filters down. Ideology determines how people interact with each other, how they live. And we can trace those sorts of things. So I think it's important to keep in mind, the more politics filters into our lives, the more we'll see this high stakes um, sort of battling between people. Absolutely. And I'm going to cap it off here because I want us to move on, guys. We're in the last 30 minutes, 25 minutes of the show. I think that's what I want to do tomorrow in, in Peter Tief, which is to show really the big, the big gulf, the, the chasm between ordinary residents who recognize, yes, there may very well be problems in Peter Tief, but we have our ways, we have our bridges that we were building to try and sort them out that are local, that are based on us as community members. Um, and then you have them, the politicians, the loudmouths, the vested interest groups, who have their own little agendas that they want to play, and we're seeing what they want to, what we're seeing what they try to do in Senegal 
try to be done here in Big Three Tech. So I'll test that. I'll test that tomorrow and I'll bring it to you guys on the Big Daddy Liberty Show this coming Wednesday. That's BDL in uh, Pete Retief. Guys, I'm going to move us on. Um, and we'll, we'll look at the state. Um, let's, let's zoom in on the state, uh, Chris. Um, you know, <clears throat> we had two interesting stories pop up here. Um, the one is this notion that Ramaphosa was selling us in the week, um, that, uh, you know, he, he's considering, we're told, a reduction in the size of cabinet. Now, if you are, if you're alive and you have a pulse in this country, you've heard this spiel before being played by the ANC when they rearranged the deck chairs um, <laughs> on the Titanic, you know, and when the music stops and we're told that there's, there's two less uh, portfolios, we're told. Um, the question that U U Verna actually posed in the group, a very good question is, was it really actually becoming small? Are we really seeing the sort of reforms that are desperately needed in terms of a massive cut that must be uh, placed on the state in order that you and I, the citizen, can have more breathing room. We can save a bit more of our money, invest a bit more of our money, and maybe even spur this economy. Chris, are we seeing the actual necessary um, hacking of the state, not just a scalpel that is desperately now required in order to free the citizen? I think you're leading the witness there. That's that, that, that's what this line of questioning <laughs> is called because you know my answer already. But it, it was something as basic as the, the rise. <laughs> with something as basic as the rise of the fuel levy, we see the unending hunger of the state. It's not going to mm. stop, and it's going to affect poor South Africans the most who have to use, for example, public transport. Those costs are passed on to them and will hit them in their pockets the most down the line. And these increases are used to, again, fund things like SAA, which is going to get, well, is projected to get another 16 billion for some insane reason. I mean, other countries have state-owned airlines, but just because another country does X doesn't mean South Africa should do X, especially given the state of our fiscus. So, I mean, again, it goes back to ideology. Um, Anthea Jeffrey from the RR has made this, I think, very easily digestible and clear for everyone to go look at. The guiding ideology of the ANC is the National Democratic Revolution, and that demands controlling the levers of power, of political power, and that includes state and enterprises. So one shouldn't be surprised when President Ramaphosa says, and I know, you know, the talk of reform and different factions within the ANC, okay, you know, you can tinker around the margins, but at base, all of them, including President Ramaphosa, want to retain ANC control of the state. So in that regard, they're going to make the noises and they're going to say, look, we're trying to reform, we're going to do X, Y, Z, but it's not the kind of radical change South Africa needs for us to make any sort of hit in the more than 11 million unemployed people, more than 42% unemployment rate. You need average GDP growth of between 5 and 7% for the next five years. South Africa might be lucky to hit 3% if commodity prices go up and that sort of thing, if we get to export certain goods, that sort of thing. We're not going to hit the necessary growth, and then unemployment is going to keep on increasing. So don't don't hold your breath. Uh, I don't think we'll see, as you said, the scalpel form of, of radical change. Um, <laughs> it's funny that you know the the RET faction of the ANC, the Radical Economic Transformation faction, with former President Zuma, they talk about radical transformation. For me, the only positive radical transformation is with increased economic freedom and economic growth, and. That sort of thing we're not going to see because that requires the state to give up some control and the ANC. And you're not going to see it. Dumont, I'm going to come to you then, Werner. Dumont, you know, if you punish a turd, it's still a turd. Uh, you know, this, <laughs> this idea that, you know, from, from, from moving from, you know, uh, 35 cabinet members to 28, if your ministers are trash, hashtag politicians are trash, remember that one. If your politicians are trash, then you'll just have 28 trash politicians in power. We need real reform and really political change in this country that moves us in a liberty direction. Or am I just being, am I being that crazy right winger, uh, libertarian? Um, or by the way, raw. there's that like, right winger raw. I forgot to did, do on the show. Uh, shout out to my haters who are waiting for that one. Um, <laughs> Are we seeing, am I just being a crazy right wing at Dumont? Uh, I, I doubt it. Um, I just think this cabinet shuffle or whatever, reducing the amount of ministers, is nothing more than a vanity project at the end of the day. Um, it's It doesn't do much. I mean, as, as Chris mentioned earlier, I mean, unemployment is off the charts. Um, it's getting worse. The necessary reforms are not being made. 
And I'm always asking, like, I don't know what I don't know why isn't there anyone within the ANC that's really gonna shake things up, like you know, really break up the tripartite alliance. Like, I, 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 these guys are so good at um, you know, stirring up racial tensions among normal South Africans, but yet they can't even break. Yet those same people can't break up the tripartite alliance for their own benefit, and that's what the country needs. I don't understand why they haven't done that, but the reality is that. You know, the South African needs to have more reforms that are just based on just taking off pressure off, you know, the poor, making it easier for the poor to escape poverty. And that's not being done. In fact, the economy is set up in such a way that the the wants of the of the political elites are being met while the needs of the rest of the population are being um you know, thrown out of the window. And that's Absolutely. a tragic situation to be with, to be in. And uh, it can only get worse from here unless something drastic happens. Absolutely. And Vera, I must bring you in on that particular point and add another little metric to the story. The state will always take its, its uh, pound of flesh. It will always demand its pound of flesh, especially the political elites. In this case, trade unions uh, that are linked to the state, of course, which are now some of the biggest trade unions in the country, that should be alarm bells in itself, are demanding salary increases of 7% for their members, um, which of course you may mention quite rightly, are unaffordable, impossible, and really irresponsible. The state, of course, offering 0%. Do you want to just weigh in on that? Yes, um, if, if the state says smaller, they mean actually larger. That's how it works. Uh, under Mbeki, we had about 50 ministers and deputy ministers. Zuma brought it to 70, and then Ramaphosa brought it back to 64. And um, very interestingly, those who made the call for a smaller uh, cabinet came from no other uh, front than the Kusatu affiliated trade unions. Kusatu and ANC, of course, are both committed to the idea that the state must play a central role. So what they ask him is not make government or the state smaller. They ask him just move around a few pieces here and so that we can get to the second point you were making. And that is the fact that uh, um, we want to have a plausible case to make for working people to say we can, we can legitimately say that our demands for a higher public wage increase are justified because we've cut the, the fat around the meat uh, um, through through Ramaphosa, so there's money there, and we can now go on with 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 our demands. Um, but I want to get on to something that Duma had said, and uh, that mm -hmm. is an important question in relation to how do you affect change in the ANC? Why why isn't there someone inside the ANC who would speak up and make stronger points in relation to the role of the state? I think if you're in the ANC, you're in a checkmate position. Ramaphosa is in a checkmate position. Each each one of them are in a checkmate position. Gwedi Mantashe once said that. Everything the ANC does is measured by those resolutions they take at the con at the Congress, the, the, the five uh, five year Congress. That is what they measured against. Uh, and one of those resolutions that they repeat every year is that the role of the state must be expanded, the power of the state must be expanded, and the state comes first. So if he does actions that might lessen that role, what you would find is he's not adhering to those resolutions, and you would have grounds in that party structure to make a case against him and remove him. So it's impossible, I think, to make change, meaningful change in relation to this topic through the ANC because you're in a checkmate position. You're not set up for that. Now, Tito Mbueni and the state is in a very difficult position in relation to these negotiations. This has been on from last year. The momentum has been built. It's been in court. They are now in talks outside. But Tito Mbueni submitted a budget which makes provision for 1.5% increase if you, if you look at the numbers. So they simply, they, at a negotiation table, and for the for the trade unions, they say they want CPI plus four percent, and oh. um, they they've also they they only got a one point five percent margin, and so the state is negotiating on something they simply cannot afford. We saw that with Eskom as well. With Eskom, they wanted wage increases, and there's simply nothing nothing left. Yeah. I remember one of the most fearful, and I say fearful. Uh, um, uh, uh, addresses I saw Ramaphosa make in Parliament. It was actually before COVID. It was the year before COVID. It was in 2019. It was a reply to a State of the Nation address, I believe, 
and he said, and there's a quotation, marks I remember it was part of the headlines, he said, we have no more money. The, the, fin the country's finances has been depleted. This has been before COVID. The country's finances has been depleted. So everything comes down to this question of what role the state should play. And um, so we're in a situation now where there's no money left. The state's going to continue to expand because if there's poverty and there's struggle, the state must provide. That's the, that's a prevailing viewpoint. So this is a misnomer. We should not, uh, I don't think we should take this this notion of the, the cabinet that will take be smaller any seriously in any way whatsoever. We know the state is going to get bigger. This is just simply a moving around of pieces. So Sikhle, we're still in for a very rough ride in the coming years. And I think the this is not the topic for tonight, but down the line, you will see relation between eight amendments going to start rolling in. They need to cash in somewhere, and and you would find that. So we don't we, we need not take this seriously. We must call it for what it is. Absolutely, Gabriel. I must come to you and 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 um, you know drop a nice quote from someone who I think Dumont will appreciate. A, a, a wise economist once said, "The first lesson of economics is scarcity. There is never enough of anything to satisfy all of those." Who want it. However, the first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. And that's a uh, Thomas Sowell, famous quote in this regard. And I, I raise this in the context of unionists. These are individuals, especially those in the public sector, who have not seen the bloodbath of the policies of their favorite politicians, as, for example, the private sector has seen. These are the same sort of, sort of people who, who genuinely think there is eight, seven to eight percent um, in, in, the, in the offering for them uh, as, as unionists. Meanwhile, workers in the private sector are saying, hey man, I'll be happy just keeping my job. Mm, mm. Yeah, I know. I remember once a family member of mine in the late 90s or early 2000s went into Kusatu House to pick up a friend and they went off for some drinks and they, they were discussing a strike action that had just happened. And, the unions had asked for too much and uh, 20,000 people had been fired as a result. And uh, and the union boss uh, at the dinner, he said, we still have what we have. And in fact, uh, rhetorically, this will this will burn people and so we'll have more to come. And in the meanwhile, uh, we've got some nice Hennessy, so enjoy yourself. Uh, <laughs> it's a story that stuck with me. But about the disconnection between the incentives of those who represent and those who are represented in these labor negotiations. And I saw a similar thing actually here in Pumalanga two months ago in a wage dispute, which ended up with someone dying. Uh, it just anyway. But look, I want to make another point, which I think is which is which is which is something that all of us should take seriously. You know. We have most people my age, our age and younger, don't have a job, not in education or training. We we are sitting on a this is a very nightmarish place. Um, uh, poverty and hunger are not as bad as in the Soviet Union or Venezuela or Zimbabwe, but it's bad. It's bad, bad, bad. Now, is a free market reformer going to change that overnight? The answer is no. The, there is no immediate solution to this problem. And, and I think that's where the commies have the advantage, is that they can pretend that there's an immediate solution. They can say, look, we're going to do the cabinet reshuffle now and we're going to uh, make SAA fly again. Just trust us. Just trust us. Give us two months and the whole country is going to be nice. And an honest free market supporter can never say that. Because the hole we are in is so deep, it is going to take time. And so I think one of the one of the things that's going to have to change if this country is going to write its course is that people are going to have to think in broader time horizons and not fall for a for the for the sucker of uh, tomorrow everything will be fine. There's no such thing as tomorrow everything will be fine. It's going to take us years. And uh, and when people are prepared to seriously lay out that five percent GDP growth year on year is still gonna it's still gonna take a generation before our unemployment rate gets down to anything remotely civilized um until until politicians are willing to to campaign on that to say i don't promise you a better tomorrow i promise you a better next generation like we're going to build up slowly slowly to do that 
and, and, and and that trick can be pulled. That trick was pulled in South Korea. America in its best century was pulling that trick. Uh, the UK, you know, it's it's not an impossible thing to persuade people uh, to expand their time horizons and say, yeah, tomorrow will be a little bit better because you'll feel more honorable because you'll know that the gains are being made are not by theft or redistribution. They're by genuine value add. But the real material gains are going to take a few years to actually land because so much has been looted. That argument can be made, but it's not being made. I don't see that coming out of the opposition either. Um, and I think that's one of the holes that we sit in. A lack of imagination and seriousness. Fully agree. And, um, you know, as, as I say that, guys, we are running out of time. I must move us on, uh, maybe on a lighter note. A, a, should I call it a more funnier note? Um, um Japan, as, as it's now been uh, labeled. Um Japan, a.k.a. Tokyo. Setwale, um, hashtag Tokyo's Drift this past week, because he sure as hell came at us sideways, man, with these allegations. Um, again, a synopsis of the story, allegations that money, uh, billions of rands meant for the Solidarity Fund were siphoned off and um, uh, looted. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the Reserve Bank then hits back and says, well, actually, no, the, the fund Mr. Sitwale is referring to is actually a scam, and Tokyo has literally been scammed. Guys, what's going on here? Demo, I'm going to ask you to make sense of it very quickly and to give you a quick take. Um, guys, please be brief. We, we, we need to wrap up. Okay. Um, okay, my, my, my quick take on this is that it could be either or. It could be that he's telling the truth, or he could be scammed. Um, I don't think he's gone insane, um, because I think that um, the... The Reserve Bank did mention that they that there was some sort of allegations like this similar in the past. So I think I think for me, Sehwale has been scammed, and um, yeah, I hope he gets his money back somehow, man. Amen. Hey, Amen. Hey, uh, I hope he gets the cash back from the white spiritual boys. Um, that's the fund he gave that cash to. Uh, <laughs> but again, I'm sorry, guys. Let me actually close it off here because again, we really have run out of time. But it, it, it does speak to just a, a rather hilarious clown world situation that we have in our national politics. Actually, no, let me be fair. Guys, I'm going to give you each very quickly 30 seconds. Werner, your thoughts on this? What's going on here? Are there any implications in this at all? Or should we just re disregard the story? No, very quickly from our side, from so Tokyo, so it's another name we've got for him. Tokyo Sex Whale. We may, might, might catch on as well. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, no, if, if, if you look at the journalists that were there, it just doesn't seem that there's any real proof. I mean, if you throw down heaps and heaps of documents, it doesn't mean they really there's proof. The, the core is there's no fund that has been proved. And for yeah. good measure, this is, my, this is my final thought, for good measure, even Q and non has disregarded the, the existence of the heritage fund. So if there's anything there, uh, uh, Q and non had said, no, there's not. So then uh, I, think, I think he hasn't scammed, unfortunately. <laughs> Yo, that's some funny stuff. And again, I'm sorry, guys. Speaking about funny stuff, let me add something quickly here just for my last two uh, guests here because I was feeling some vibrations um, coming through uh, into the stream. And the one, a one CEO of, uh, of SAA sent what can only be described as the, an odd, 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 odd communicate to staff, the same staff who are very worried for good reason, of course, as to the state of the um, the, 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 the SOE. It, it's effectively insolvent, if I'm to be brutally honest, but he sends a communique where at the end, um, and please bear with me, guys, because I really want to get it out. Um, all right, hang on, hang on, give me a chance. Don't make me laugh, guys, don't make me laugh. Um, but at the end of the communique, he basically said, this is after detailing, you know, the, the back and forth between them as SAA or Mango, excuse me, Mango, 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 and the state, how they're waiting for that bailout. That, that's the one they can pay to their creditors. Now, he's left his stuff with a cliffhanger. Surely, at the end of this letter, he's not going to galvanize them, inspire them, and, you know, guys, we may be shutting down on the 1st of May, but here's a nice message. Here, here's the message from Rahomi. This is from uh, William Gilford, the CEO of Mango. <clears throat> don't, don't, don't make me laugh, guys, don't make me laugh. It is at this point that our thoughts and feelings must be geared towards seeing Mango surviving the current storm. 
The universal energy of uh, the universal energy or oh God always responds to our vibrations. Our vibration is caused by our frequency. Our frequency is caused by our thoughts and feelings. Homie continues on this vein for a whole ass paragraph. And I'm sure staff at Mango are like, the hell is this? <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, <laughs> Chris, what's going on here? It, it, does this not exemplify the absolute comical state of our SOEs in a, a tragic way, given that there are people's jobs at the line, I suppose? I think you've summed it up perfectly. So I, I mean, you, you know, I, I can't add a lot to what you said there. If it only took good vibrations, then maybe the SOEs, all of our SOEs would be fine, but yeah, <laughs> that's not the case, unfortunately. Just, I have to go back just on, on the, the point with, uh, with Tokyo. In his defense, if he did donate to the Solidarity Fund, I wouldn't be surprised if it was looted because we saw COVID-19 PPE equipment looting. So I just have to... Out there. If he did give to the, if he gave to the right, the right account number, the right solidarity fund, not the solidarity fund, because then he'd probably also be upset. <laughs> then me, also the president. Hey man, I can tell you now there will be good vibrations in that too, uh, in the sense of a white spiritual, uh, was it white spiritual, uh, something or other. Speaking about white, the Beach Boys probably we were the inspiration for the Mango uh, CEO. Uh, good vibrations. Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> um, uh, dude, we'll end off with you um, as we do. Um, uh, you know, quick comment and how do we reach you? How do we get in touch with your work, uh, Gabriel? Yeah, man. If 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 only we could eat like brand mangoes, idea mangoes. If if <laughs> if dreams and prayers were reality, there'd be no hungry bellies in South Africa tonight or during apartheid or ever. And it's not the case. Yeah, check it out. Ch check check our work out on the Daily Friend. Um, and and also, yeah, I, I want to say to all the listeners, check out check out the Big Daddy Liberty Show, especially coming on Wednesday, because yeah. I think what you see what you did last uh, when we were last together in Senegal was extraordinary. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to what you what you do tomorrow. I think it's a very hectic situation, and I yeah. and I more than anything want to finish off by saying, Sitley, I hope you stay safe tomorrow. And, uh, yeah. and and that and that all the people that we speak to also stay safe tomorrow. Yeah, dude, it's gonna be crazy out there. I can just see it. And this is where often we we you know we we, we malign them. Really, Saps must play their role tomorrow. Um, uh, and with that being said, let me just quickly say I will get to everybody else. Um, I'm not knocking the CEO's uh, belief in God, by the way. Shout out to him on that. But hey, man, that good vibrations vibe that had me. I won't lie, that had me in stitches. Um, Chris, homie. How do we reach you? Uh, where do we find your work? Yeah, thank you, Sikle, and thank you to the fellow panelists. I had a very, very good time this evening, so thank you very much for all your thoughts. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook, Chris Hutton. Please uh, support the Free Market Foundation, www.freemarketfoundation.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, and on our YouTube channel. Um, please subscribe to our channel there for all of our podcasts and other content. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Brother man, Verna, how do we reach you, homie? And uh, of course, we'll definitely have you on the show again. Please, thank you. This is this is this is really great. Uh, the vibrations I quickly want to share is that um, although we've got municipal elections coming in October, but uh, that that determines for us that we must also act every five years with a vote. And I hope that people listening to this knows that that it doesn't work like that. You do, you need to do it constantly, and that is the work that I do at the Solidarity Movement. We've got uh, organizations like Afri Florum, Solidarity, Helping Hands. We've got 23 of those institutions. What we try and do is create circumstances where there's less state, more community, mutual respect and recognition. We are on all, all the platforms we would find with the names I've mentioned, and, uh, uh, and we look forward to contributing to, to the country in a sane and reasonable and rational way. Thank you for the guests as well. This has been, this has been a pleasant exercise. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Vatman. Excuse me. Oops. Um, Dumo, last but not least, brother, how do we reach you? And what are you going to be looking at this week? All right. Okay. So we have, I have a website, manpatriot.com. We have shows that are released there. One, the Free Man series, and the other one is the Man Patriot podcast, which is the flagship show, which is released every Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Also, take note that uh, we'll be running a competition where Ooh. guys could actually win a voucher to our shop to the value of 299 Rand, which you can actually get your T-shirt for free. 
So oh, please nice. look out on our social media on Monday and you'll see that. So we're giving away free stuff, guys. Come on. You know, hey, we man. like the government now. So, hey, but we're just using our money, not taxpayers' money. Yeah. <laughs> we're putting that commie vibe up in here. We see you, dog. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, guys, for having joined us on the stream. Uh, I will let you guys um, just get at all as I quickly um, mess with my screen here. And thank you, dear viewer, for watching the show. It's been an absolutely lovely, lovely, lovely show. Big, big thanks to my guests and their organizations for having joined us. Remember, if you want to support the work of the Big Daddy Liberty Show, you can do that by just, hey man, have a look at the descriptor uh, below you and you can make a contribution to the show. I just wanna quickly shout out some guys uh, who have supported uh, me on the show. In fact, I'll, let me do that on Wednesday. Let me do that on Wednesday. But there've been some really, really awesome support from you guys, even one donation of a, a Oh, a, a thousand rand. So really a big, big, big appreciation. And thank you to you guys. It is exactly those funds that allows me to get around and to go to places like Peter Retief et al. So major, major thank you. I will do a full thank you list on the Wednesday show. Super appreciated. And thank you guys and, uh, and the like. So guys, thank you so much for watching. This has been another episode of Liberty and Friends. I'll see you on Wednesday for the Big Daddy Liberty show. And then of course, next week sunday with the new panel um yeah guys please drop those comments i genuinely do watch them excuse me i do read them let me know what you think about the show if you have some ideas for the show i also welcome those i will go through those too right with that being said thank you so much for watching and a reminder to you as we always end our shows never trust a commie <laughs>